Back in 1981, Lotus was developing the Esprit. They wondered if its active suspension could be made to work in F1, and a year later at Snetterton, they began secret tests. Sadly, team founder Colin Chapman suffered a heart attack that very morning, but his dream wouldn't die with him. Back then, Lotus was grappling with a pitch-sensitive car that not even a beefed-up suspension managed to cure. The team was at a loss, so they turned to Professor David Williams, who hit on a bit of a brainwave. When he suggested designing a hydraulic suspension that could control the ride height of the car. At a time when track surfaces were about as smooth as a teenager's face, an active suspension would give Lotus a huge advantage in grip. Chapman liked the sound of this and gave his designer Peter Wright and Professor Williams 12 months to develop the suspension. 12 months. That's it. But even with the tight schedule, by December of 82, the active car had taken to the track. However, it would be a day marred by tragedy as Chapman himself passed away that very morning. Undeterred, Lotus ran the active car at the start of 83. However, Nigel Mansell was less than pleased with it. He complained that it added weight and decreased power, and it's ironic how he'd become the first driver to win the title in an active car. Still, the team listened to him, but predictably, it did nothing to help the car's performance. In the mid-80s, it proved near impossible to harness the potential of the system, as teams were fixated on using what little electronics they had on managing the efficiency of the thirsty turbos. By 1987, Lotus were happy enough to install it on their cars once again, and this time for the whole season. Senna demonstrated its benefits by taking two wins at two bumpy street tracks. However, by waiting for four years, Lotus had squandered their advantage and it would be another British automotive giant that would show its full potential, Williams. The defining moment came at Monza. When Senna slid into the gravel, he surrendered the lead to PK. As Williams took its first active suspension win, Lotus had surrendered their advantage too. From then on, their stories took very different paths. While Williams retained active suspension for 1988, they endured a torrid season, with a leak in their active suspension allowing air into the system making the car uncontrollable, which made Mansell, who joined Williams by then, an unhappy bunny. Things were so bad at the British Grand Prix that they had to convert his car from active to passive overnight. He went on to score a second place, and that put active suspension in the bin. At least, for the moment. Still, at Lotus, having taken two wins in 87, you'd have expected them to run it again in 1988. However, Lotus Engineering, the F1 team's road car division, which was now owned by General Motors, had bankrolled and maintained the suspension themselves all season, but they weren't ready to do that in 1988. Peter War, the team principal by then, decided to send the General Motors officers packing, ditching active again. In the next two years, neither team used active suspension, but Williams would bring it back at the final round at Adelaide in 1991. Unfortunately, the conditions there were so bad that up until Belgium last year, it was the shortest race in F1 history. In 1992, both Lotus and Williams would install it on their cars. Again, it would be Williams who got the better deal, as they swept the championships. At Lotus, they could only manage a handful of points, they had frittered away the technology that might well have returned them back to the top, and by the end of 1994, by which time active suspension was banned, the team went out of business. Across 11 seasons, active suspension had advanced from zero to hero, only for those who'd had the foresight to develop it to be told that they were ruining the sport, and so, predictably, the FIA banned it. So this has been our journey back to an active suspension was a thing. We hope you enjoyed it, and until next time, 
Goodbye.